You're watching Telecom TV from SDN NFE World Congress in The Hague. Where is the value of open source in next generation networks and what are the main deployment challenges that CSPs need to be aware of? Well, helping to discuss these main issues today, I'm joined by four leading open source proponents and I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves, starting on my far right with Mark. Uh, thank you guys. So, hi, my name is Mark Whiteway. I'm the head of sales for uh, Lumina here in, in Europe. Uh, Lumina is a open source company focused very heavily on uh, open daylight and enriched applications around that. Great, and, and Timo? Yes, my name is Timo Joki. I'm um, from Red Hat, based in Finland, and I'm a global lead of our telco partner, partner technology development and, and alignment. Great, and on my left we have Anat. Hi, my name is Anat Kleinman. I'm leading the Solution Architect team in Amdocs. Great, and Jengis. Hi, I'm Jengis Alatunolu. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Blue Planet, a division of Siena. And Blue Planet is composed of lots of, lots of open source uh, components, actually. Well, let's get down to basics straight away. Um, when we talk about um, deploying open source in telecoms networks, w where do you think the, the main locations are that we can leverage open source to create functional value for 5G and MEC? Mark, let me, let's start with you. So I think the main areas is, is the um, leveraging open source across the, the multi-domain areas that uh, 5G is going to have to encompass. So um, we all know that uh, telecoms operators are not going to necessarily uh, you know, get rid of a lot of their equipment they've got in play today. So it's, it's key that you have a, a, a solution which befits everything, both the, uh, the new ORAN, some of the ORAN solutions, but as much as the, the legacy and core infrastructure that they have to have today. So uh, open source has that interoperability you know, cross layer, cross domain, which I think is absolutely key for enabling this to, to actually come to uh, fruition in the short term. Mm. Timo, what, what's, what's your views? Yeah, easy to agree with Mark, first of all. And uh, if you think about the whole uh, 5G development and even uh, starting from 5G standardization, it's very much software driven, which is a new phenomena in, in mobile network standardization. So software in general fits in all places and wherever there is a software, it can be open source, obviously. It will not be all open source, but it could. And, uh, and for example, having a consistent open source based software platform in all of the places in 5G network, starting from the disaggregated base station, that would be a, a really, really a fantastic thing for the operators to operate their or, or, or re relocate their workloads. Great, and if I move over to my left, and at wh wh where does Amdoc see um, open source's value in, in 5G and MEC? So we believe that uh, in, in 5G, uh, the first thing that would ne need to be done is to model the solution in a bit of a different way. Until today, it was um, different domains separated from each other, and the open source will open uh, the solution to um, include an end-to-end -end solution in a multi-domain environment. And we see the great value in, first of all, modeling the um, solution in a common uh, open source uh, language, uh, which will um, address all the different domains. Um, one use case is network slicing, another one is placement, so everywhere, everywhere. basically, yeah. Everywhere, Jengis? I mean, in the Edge compute is clear, the OpenStack will have a big role, orchestration will have a big role. But I think the, where the big opportunity for open source lies is really the 5G core. As you know, it is disaggregated and virtualized. From the 4G, we had four or five or so components in the mobile core. Now we are with 10 plus components in the uh, 5G core. And that means actually each of these pieces by itself needs to work with the other pieces, but each of these pieces maybe perhaps is more amenable for open source development. It can coexist with other components from other vendors or other open source projects. You can actually compose them. I think the, the fact that the 5G is so disaggregated is actually a great opportunity for open source to come and pick up some of these components and uh, replace. Yeah. But, but the industry also has to work with, with standards. Um, it's come from very standardized legacy. How well are they currently coexisting, or aren't they? <laughs> Actually, I don't see, the, uh, th there's always a you know, question about is the open source and standards contradicting, conflicting, competing, right? I don't see them as competing actually, they really complement each other. 
let me continue on my 5G example, for example. It's going to be disaggregated. This is 10 to 12 pieces. There is a bus in between these, and they need to talk. And if I need to talk, uh, I, I, let's say I wrote an open source component for one of these, and I need to talk to some other component on this bus, I need to have standards APIs to be able to do that. Otherwise, we are developing, whether it is open source, whether it is vendor, we are developing this monolith aggregated software. If you wanted to open it up, you must have APIs, standards APIs. This can come from TM Forum, this can come from ITF with the Yang models, it can come from MEF and uh, ONF and you know all, all sorts of places. But I think the standards is key to basically making this disaggregation work, and that creates, in my opinion, an opportunity for the open source. Great, and Timo, you're agreeing? I, ac I agree absolutely, and as I said earlier, 5G core network standardization has taken a software approach, and they have taken a lot of uh, kind of API flavors from the open source industry already into the standard. Uh, having a containerized uh, core, which is excellent news, I think, for everybody. Yeah, I think that, that you know there needs to be a slightly more closed-loop feedback between essentially the uh, you know what the open source community is doing in terms of the deployment of of software, and then those standards bodies, because your standards bodies are good at doing the uh, I think the frameworks, but the, the the actual you know when you want to kick the tires, the software, the open source pieces is, is where it starts to really hit the road. I would so like to add on top of that that the devil is in the details, yes. Yes. and open source is the details. Yeah. The Standards are the, you know, framework as you said. Just to add one more kind of dimension to this discussion, there are standards in the networks, existing and 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 uh, 5G networks which have nothing to do with uh, open source, like uh, radio interface standard. It's a standard of its own, so there is no conflict in those standards. Let's move on to deployments and where we're seeing open source at the moment. And at w w where are we in t as an industry in terms of you know, testing and deploying these early solutions? So um, on our experience, um, deployment and open source is um, at the beginning is always challenging because open source has a lot of features which are common to a lot of companies that are contributing to the open source yet when it comes to productization, then we encounter the challenges and the challenges can be logging, uh, packaging, and that's where we face um, live deployments, a real um, a need. And that's where we, th that's our lesson learned from our experience where we deployed open source. There was always a need to do the extra uh, packaged, high availability uh, and hardening in order to make it work. Yeah, yeah, true. So uh, from Red Hat point of view, we are the 100% open source upstream company. We, d we only do that. So that's, uh, that's clear and our, our uh, place in building network is also very clear. It's Linux distribution, virtualization platform, and container platform, and that what that's what we do. And obviously, there's uh, a lot of uh, Red Hat based uh, deployments. I'm not saying that they have been easy projects, no, but they are there. And uh, and like the NFE architecture and uh, OpenStack specifically is uh, now fairly mature, but it's not still like push button and everything is done so yeah for me I see, uh, it, it the key for for the for the open source community is is interoperability and sustainable interoperability um, uh, in the life cycle and I think that's you know uh, some of the challenges are in the life cycle of open source you know as it goes into you know not just where we are today but as we move forward into 5g that that's going to be critical mm. and Jenkins, are, are, are we seeing uh, that you know a challenging environment in, in doing open source well, not just uh, doing it, but actually doing it well. Well, doing it well actually requires a cultural shift, a cultural change in the service provider as well. Actually, it's kind of interesting because early on on the internet in the 90s and when the ISPs started, it was more of a community driven approach. Everyone wanted internet to succeed. It was a question mark. And then they adopted open source. Actually, the devices that ran the internet those days, they ran open source software. They were not coming from Cisco and Juniper and these vendors that we use to today. They were actually like AT ran on the routers of today. And then uh, Red Hat and others with the LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, they revolutionized and they brought the web to all of us. 
And then, you know, in those days, we all worked together. Actually, I did in those days work on an open source project. It's still alive, <laughs> as a matter of fact. I'm very happy about that. But, uh, you know, we, we all worked towards the common good of the Internet, that we kind of form our community. And then what happened is, as the Internet became a success, all of these ISPs, one by one, got acquired by the traditional telco CSPs. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or whatever, but in the process, we got a hardened internet experience. In the 90s, when the website didn't work, we clicked the refresh button. That was kind of like the way we, the web browsers work. These days, you don't have a refresh button on the browser because the network, the infrastructure, the services, everything is so robust. And that came with that first cultural shift. But if you want the open source to be successful again, we still have to switch back a little bit, still keep the hardening, just like the Anat has mentioned. But, uh, but switch back so that we work towards the common good of the software. And uh, there is a community for open source, and there's a second approach, which is more like, the, OK, I, I, I am writing software. I am making it open and available, but I am in charge. That's not the community approach. I think that's not the approach that will work for service providers. And uh, with the service providers, they all lining up behind big projects is good, but I also see for example, they keep some of the crown jewels to themselves. And then they contribute a huge amount of code, but they keep the crown jewels. And then if, if there's a community behind this open source portion, and if that evolves so that it's no longer compatible with your crown jewels, now you have a conflict. So you're no longer a community. You are breaking this community approach. I think the service providers really need to question, do they really want to form a community and be friendly, compete at the same time, but you know, really, work towards the common good of their community? Or do they want the other approach where basically it's kind of like the Android, right? I mean, it's basically, it's a Google project. It's not an open source project. I mean, it's an open source, but it's not a community project, I should say. We have a great example what operators have done, ONAP and OSM. Operators put together two major open source projects to collaborate between each other, even, you know, competitors. Great examples. This leads me on to beyond the technology and the internal cultural shift, is this also an important requirement as well as purely looking at the technology changes that open source is bringing? So maybe I start on that because uh, the culture is something where what Red Hat is famous on, I mean our culture internally, uh, and it's all about, uh, all kind of uh, circling around the open source. So the code is, code is available, all that stuff, but the most more important thing is the the collaboration, transparency, everybody helping each other. That's what Red Hat does. We have done it that 25 years, and that's what we have been uh, uh, telling to service providers, equipment providers, that if you really want to take uh, full advantage on on open source model, you need to think about your organization, your culture, your procurement, and all these things. And are they changing? slowly, but uh, everybody at least listens and kind of uh, agrees and understands that that has to change as well. Right. Mark, can we not separate technology and culture? They're, they're intertwined? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think you know, it, it, it is a challenge to embrace collaboration in, in, in its true form, um, but, I, but I do think it is a challenge for the, the operators to, to get to that. And I think the more they can embrace that from a cultural perspective, the quicker they get to where they want to get to. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a key aspect of, of, of a challenge that they've got, which in part they've, they've resolved, but there's still a lot, long way to go. So Nat, do you, do, you, do you see the importance of, of cultural change as well? Yeah, so I see the importance of cultural change and I can speak about Amdocs internally, how we embrace the open source code. And I initially, you know, it's something that is um, evolving and we see it in our products. So we invest in open source, we invest in our partners, uh, we have a good partnership with Reddit and with other companies that are investing in open source and are open source based companies. Uh, we see it in our products, and uh, we see that that's the future. Right. Can I ask you all a final question? Uh, and, and that is where we each see our own companies providing the unique value to service providers who are looking to deploy open source solutions, and, and maybe what your views, are the long-term views of the sector are. 
Jacob, I'm going to start with you. Sure. I mean, uh, Blue Planet, you know, is actually really built on top of open source software. And then what we are hearing from our customers is really componentization. Basically, they want to be able to pick components from open source software, from their legacy OSS, PSS software, from our components, uh, some of them open, some of them not so, and being able to compose them together and provide solutions to the market and harden solutions to the market. And ONAP, for example, has a big role in that one. And uh, for example, our policy engine is based on the ONAP policy engine, it provides a great reference as well as a source code for the community. And then, but ultimately what they want to be able to do is pick the best of breed from different components. And we're definitely working towards that. Standards is a big role in that one because you want to be able to talk to the other components and then TM Forum and uh, other organizations provide those uh, standards for us. And uh, we're definitely uh, working towards giving our customers basically that componentized architecture and solutions to them. What about Amdocs? Um, so Amdocs uh, has been investing in ONAP since the days it was a, an e-comp solution for AT&T. After that it became an ONAP uh, in the Linux Foundation. And uh, we were the key contributors for uh, over the years. Um, we invested in uh, the design process um, of the open source. We believe that that's the open gate towards the open source um, software and solutions. And uh, we also see the great value for our customers because it's not only that we're pushing the solution, it's they're willing and want to get it from us. So they're asking us, please provide us. What do you contribute in open source? That's one of the key requirements from customers. And Timo, obviously Red Hat is a, a, a key player in open source. Yeah, so our, our position in building network is, is very clear. It's a, a Linux distribution as an operating system, OpenStack as a virtualization platform, and OpenShift as a container platform in, in all of the places where it fits, and it fits throughout the network. Now, and that's what we have been doing so far. Um, and uh, just a one important point of our uh, development model, which is unique because um, we call it open source upstream first. I'm not going to explain it in detail because that would take a long time, but uh, the key point is that we never deviate from community releases, never. And we never build custom code for anybody, not for Red Hat, not for partners, not for our operator customer. It's always aligned with the community releases. We don't deviate. Great, and, and, and Mark, finally, Lumina Networks, wh where do you play and what's your view of the long-term future? So for Lumina, it's, it's leveraging uh, open source, open daylight to, to help uh, our customers fulfill the, the needs that they have today in terms of, you know, a lot of these have not even completed the automation orchestration journey uh, across all those domains that we talked about earlier. So, so actually fulfilling that today before they move on to the challenges that 5G will bring. You know, for Lumina, that, that's our focus so that they can actually get the benefits of, of those things that are being talked about, let alone moving on to uh, the, the areas of, 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 of next in, in terms of 5G and what that then tends to bring. So for us, it's that focus on getting the, uh, the, the value out of the networks today uh, before they even start to take that leap into the, uh, the next phase. Great. Well, look, all of you, thank you very much indeed for your, for your contributions um, as you've been looking at the value of open source in next generation networks. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.